All right, welcome back to a bonus episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, let me tell you what we're doing right now. We're getting ready to uh, release some of the archive that we found from when we were the sci-fi shenanigans. Uh, we're going to get those up there for for the posts that were brought down. We thought you might enjoy them. Um, and so without further ado, let us uh, let us roll that beautiful... Oh, wait, they're going to sue me. Play it. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity. Over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, Jared Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans out over a science fiction passion a place where the sky's the limit space is the place and nerds run the world without further ado all right welcome back for another episode today we have a mr jonathan yanez is that how you say Yay. it Sorry. hey Did guys I get the it's Jan, right? yes like you're Jan. super tired from working all day and then add it easy at the end got it yan yes okay <laughs> there you go so according to his profile, he's more animal than man. He bleeds caffeine and oh, I'm just kidding. I'm sure he's kidding too, right? But it sounded cool. Uh, he writes because he was born to do that and he freaking loves it. And when he's not writing crazy stories, he's at home with his wife and two-year-old daughter creating crazy memories. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's because uh, sometimes I forget if I have a crazier time writing these like space marines going out or chasing down my own little space marine here at the house. <laughs> so and, and if you thought that was a way more creative introduction than we normally do it's because it was all jonathan <laughs> i uh i actually switched it right because before i'd have my introduction like uh jack london award winner like tw- I, 27 novels now 27 novels but i thought like who really cares about that they want to get to know me as a person so there's no better way that for me to explain myself or like you can hear my voice by just doing how i would normally talk to you Nice. Works for me. So, but, um, and then the second part of the interview we do every week, dear listener, is uh, we say how we met them. So, um, this is a unique one for us that uh, Jonathan actually found me. Uh, we were both in some of the same professional groups um, and we knew some of the same people. So, he reached out and introduced himself and arranged a mailing list swap. I would not have done so because I kind of felt like I was too small potatoes to offer anything. I think at the time, I literally only had 100 people on my mailing list. So, <laughs> it's and a he win. reached out to me and we just <laughs> stayed in touch. He's, he's a real fun guy, as you can tell. And uh, the rest is history. What about you, Chris? How did you find the one, the only, the international man of mystery? Well, Jonathan and I met at a Star Trek convention. Uh, yeah. We were both dressed as Klingons Chris and hit it off right memory. away. That right. was a while ago, too. I forgot about that, Chris. Yeah, and, and then uh, after comparing who had the most warhead wrinkles and whose batleth was sharper, uh, he was shocked to discover that I wasn't actually wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or I met him through JR, who literally knows everybody. I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with the, the option A. <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, that's what I so, thought it was. So normally we ask the, the the dreaded religion question: Star Wars, Star Trek, Firefly. But it sounds like you um, you just joined the dark side and answered wrong. So we might have to boot him. <laughs> but Chris, no, actually, uh, I mean, <laughs> can I throw in even a different option? Can I say Stargate? Absolutely. And so sure. The, the other best answer we have was from um, author C.J. Carilla, who's he's a funny guy. But his answer was, all of them, the Holy Trinity, of course. What kind of heathen are you? <laughs> best answer ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I do love Stargate. I remember watching the, the, the original movie for the first time. Do you remember when, watching that in the 90s when it came out? John? I do. I remember watching it and just being blown away, just falling in love with the possibilities of what could be on the other side of the Stargate. I, I did right. too. When I watched the original movies that spawned the series, I remember watching that with my dad. It was one of the the boys' night out treats, and I, I remember thinking, "Man, this could create like a whole cult movement." It was that awesome when I watched it. 
Like the idea that the aliens created the pyramids and the pyramids were really spaceships. Yeah, for sure. Have you checked out the new stuff? Have you checked out Stargate Origins? I haven't. I think you have to be a Netflix member to watch it, don't you? So they're doing something that's super smart too, how everybody's going to like this paid for service like Netflix and um, like Hulu, all these guys, uh, they're doing the same thing. But for 20 bucks, a one-time 20 bucks deal, you can get the entire Stargate um, canon. So they'll give you, for 20 bucks, they'll give you all of uh, the first Stargate series, Atlantis, Origins, and Universe. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Now, I own the Atlantis and the uh, SG-1 box set. I need to get the original 94 movie, and I need to get uh, SGU, but I own the other two. But that sounds like a great deal. For sure. Look into it. I got it to, for my brother-in-law for his birthday because he's a huge Stargate fan as well. And uh, yeah, for 20 bucks, they give you all the movies. I feel like all the movies are included in that as well. Wow, that's great. Outstanding. Did you uh, Have you seen that series, Chris? I haven't. I, I I saw the original movie and I saw the first spinoff, but then after that, I I just got busy doing something else. Uh, what you in '94? Weren't you in the uh, the Marines at that time? No, that was just before the Marines. Okay. Well, the Marines sort of took all your time, I'm sure, and that that explains your lack of time. Yeah. <laughs> so many crayons. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you get that joke, uh, Jonathan? I have no idea, but I will laugh politely. <laughs> so, so the running joke in the new memes, like this is this the, this uh, trend happened after I got out in in '07. But there's this running joke that the Marines are the uh, the special children, and they're the ones that you know eat the glue in kindergarten and eat crowns. Oh, so that's, gotcha. the, that's the running joke about eat him eating crowns. <laughs> <he's a Marine. laughs> I got it. All so, right. So, so Jonathan, what do you love about science fiction? I think just going back to kind of what I said uh, before, just when we were talking about Stargate, and just about the unlimited possibilities, where I feel like science fiction isn't just science fiction. Science fiction is everything, right? Because, I mean, if you can go through, just like Stargate, if you can go through one of these wormholes, you could be in a land where there's leviathans and griffins. You could go through one of these wormholes and be like in a post-apocalyptic universe, like Mad Max. So it's just the freedom, I guess, is why I love it so much. The freedom that you can create and you can send your characters anywhere. We get that a lot. And honestly, that's why I like it too. But then I feel like, am I just being lazy? Should I be writing something more difficult? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Because I can write anything I want as long as I put a blaster in it. It's sci-fi. <laughs> to say that there is easy, I mean, have you ever tried to calculate like – descent trajectory for like orbital bodies. No, no, no. There's nothing easy about figuring out the science, especially from the idiot over here who drooled and slept his way through like <laughs> Betty Crocker biology in college. It's called hand <laughs> Well, I, I try to get some of the science, right? What about you, Jonathan? Do you bother with the science or you just wave your hand and say poof? Uh, I just wave my hand and say poof. I'm with you, JR. I was actually, you were talking about drooling. I'm not sure if you were teasing or not. But the other night, I was so tired, I actually woke up drooling. That's a true story. <laughs> so I went um, to a military college. And so I remember it was my freshman year. You know, they do the whole plebe mess with you stuff. And uh, I fell asleep in biology class. And I guess that was the class that the uh, president of the college, the retired general, decided to show up. And so he sat next to me. Not only was I drooling on my desk in class, I was like snoring. So I, I ended up getting getting to meet the general. And he, he told me quite politely that if I was going to be so rude as to sleep through class, the least I could do is not drool and snore. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, I had some interesting experiences. <laughs> so, Jonathan, so I was not was joking your, about the drool. So Jonathan, what was your first memory of watching, reading, or playing in the sci-fi world universe? I have this memory growing up and uh, growing up, you know, my parents were really into, you know, play outside, read, go, uh, you know, color, be a kid instead of just sitting in front of the TV watching TV. Like we would have TV time, but that was kind of like the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was little, I got really sick. I can't remember if it was the flu, just a really bad cold, something like that. But I remember one of our family friends coming over and lending us something called a VHS tape. I don't think those exist anymore. <laughs> But, uh, oh, they, they did. I've got 50 of them. <laughs> uh, they lent us the uh, Star Wars trilogy. 
So, oh wow! I, I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing I was like five or six. I have a really bad memory for this stuff, but I was super small. So I remember being sick, lying in my parents' bed, and watching the Star Wars trilogy, and then just falling in love with it. Nice. Yeah, I, I was. That came out like I think the third one came out when I was still a baby. So yeah, I watched it as reruns as well. But uh, oh, VHS. Yeah. So VHS. was were, was your was your family VHS or Betamax? I, I've heard this argument from my parents, and I, I'm so dumb, I have no idea what they're talking about. We were uh, VHS. That's the earliest I can remember growing up, from VHS to Blu-ray. And now we don't even use Blu-ray at our house anymore. We just stream everything. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, j- just think about it. A, a child today, a child born today, will not know life before the internet. So... Just as a aside for, you know, the change and evol- uh, evolution of technology. So my, uh, I think I've mentioned it several times, but my youngest son is, is autistic. And so when we were getting his testing done, you know, to, to get, you know, everything lined up, like they were telling us they had to change the, the test because modern kids, even if they're, you know, uh, neurotypical, um, don't know like what a, a an envelope with a stamp on it looks like because they have everybody emails everything. <laughs> and so they, they had to change the phone because the old corded phone that you see in the test, you know, what is this? What do you do with this? Like they had no idea what that was. It looked like an alien device to them. So they've, they've actually had to change some of the medical testing to accommodate technology. It's so crazy. Right. I think I feel like my sister was telling me not too long ago that my nephew was asking what a newspaper was. <laughs> that's how wow. it was very evolving. makes you feel old huh for sure or do you guys remember thomas guides yeah yes right those just i vaguely, mean but uh, yeah they might exist somewhere out there still but i mean everybody's just using the gps on their phones yep yeah i so. still have the um i still have one of the old like brick ones that you were supposed to put on your dash yeah for gps <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Jonathan, how'd you go from the love of science fiction to writing science fiction? So, it was last year that I had a, a wake up call because I had been writing for almost five years at that point, and everything that I was writing just was not was just not managing to stick in the Amazon ranks. So, I, I reached out to a bunch of guys, including Chris Fox. Um, everybody, you know, pretty much in that 20 books to 50 K group and just was trying to figure out what was going to work. Cause I knew that I'm an author. I knew that I was never going to stop writing, but it would just be nice to make a living at what I wanted to do. So at the time, and I still do this too, I part-time, uh, personal train. So I was doing that and then writing full-time, but still, you know, paychecks were coming in like, Six, seven hundred dollars when I would, you know, for a month to Amazon, that's not enough to live, let alone live in, try to live in Southern California. <laughs> so I was like, I am going to change it up, right? It's going to be um, insanity. Who, somebody has that saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I was, I told myself I was going to switch it up and I was going to write to market. And for me, I think a lot of people have a misconception about writing to market. Some people think, oh, well, you're selling out because you're writing just in a market that you know that is hungry. For me, I write character-driven stories. So for me, putting these same characters in a different setting is as fun to me as writing any other story. And it's not like, oh, I'm just going to write sci-fi because I'm going to write to market. I'm going to write character-driven stories. And the the reason that I bring this up is... um, like Wolverine is a great character, right? So Wolverine is going to be that same hard edge, kill him first, ask questions later, whether he's in a post-apocalyptic universe or he's in like our day-to-day urban setting. He's the same guy. So when I started writing sci-fi, I told myself, I'm not going to change the way that I write. My characters are still going to be the same. They're just going to be in a different setting. So I started writing sci-fi at the end of last year with Justin Sloan. And we put together a series called The War Wolves. And I did three books in that series and put it out and it did amazing. I had my first five digit month and that's when I had this wake up call like, I'm home. This is it. And that Uh, was nice. Yeah, it was it was crazy for going somebody who, you know, had struggled and had already written. I think at that point I had written 21 or 22 books 
and it was like urban fantasy supernatural to all of a sudden finding these like awesome hungry sci-fi readers who loved my work. And I have to say something too about the sci-fi community because I was in that urban fantasy community and no disrespect to the urban fantasy people out there because I'm still friends with a lot of them and a lot of them are really cool, but it is, there is something different about the sci-fi community. Like, I don't know if you guys have noticed that too, but I don't know if it's a level of camaraderie or mutual respect for one another, but just like people willing to, you know, to help you out, to give you advice as long as they see you putting in the effort and the work, they're willing to go that extra mile answering questions you have. Um, So yeah, so I wrote the Warwolf series. That was the end of last year. And then the beginning of this year, I started my own series, the gateway to the galaxy. Nice. Yeah. I I really have noticed that people, people going out of their way in the, uh, amongst the sci-fi authors and even the sci-fi fans going out of their way to help out. Yeah. I really have noticed that for sure. It's, And it's something that, again, that I haven't really found as much in other genres. Like to give you an example, when I was looking for people to help a newsletter swap with me, uh, JR mentioned this before, kind of like in the pre-show when we were talking. So I was asking Mm -hmm. and reaching out to authors. Most of them I did know already and I had some sort of relationship with. Some of them I didn't. But even the ones that I didn't were still willing to help. You know, this guy they didn't know from Adam who was, you know, hungry and willing to like newsletter swap with them and. And um, if it wasn't for the community and for the readers, especially, of course, I definitely would not be able to not only live in Southern California, but thrive in Southern California now. Right. So one one thing, just in case the listeners aren't aware, because this is some um, backroom sort of stuff. But so most of us that do newsletter swaps, when he's talking about that, where we'll that's basically if we find, you know, an author whose stuff we like, we share it. So like when somebody approaches me, I don't say yes until I've actually, you know, gone and bought one of their books and read it to make sure I'm not recommending garbage. Um, Because obviously, you know, your your readers respect your opinion or they wouldn't be following you. So you you obviously have to guard that jealously. Wait a minute, JR. Are Are you giving me a compliment saying my writing is not garbage? I am. I am. So I actually, (laughs) I, I bought book one. I bought book one when we did the swap of Warwolves and read it before before I did the uh, the recommendation. So so for most authors, it, it's you know they they all are doing the same thing because their name is their brand, and so you know it, it's not like we're just like okay I'll I'll throw out whatever and, and hope it's good and I don't look like an idiot. Most I think most authors are, are you know vetting as well. Yeah, for sure. That's a that's a good um, point too. So if you have that idea to go out there and ask people to share your book. Um, either you can gift them a copy or, you know, have them pick up a copy of your book or likewise, what you're saying, JR, if somebody asks you, make sure you vet them first before you start sharing. So I've actually only done yours is the only one yours, um, that I did without like with, with prompting, like when you said, Hey, do you mind? Like most of the other ones that if you're listening and you've, you're on my newsletter, like most of the other ones are just books that I liked. So, um, you know, I, I think people get this misconception when they hear, oh, you're giving away, you know, my, my email or whatever. That's not the case. It's mostly us checking out their book. And if we like it, telling our, our followers about it more than anything else. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, we're all readers, but there's some readers out there who are like on steroids who will go through a book a day, sometimes a book like in a few hours. They just like right. crank through them. So you're not doing any sort of disservice to yourself by recommending cool new books for your readers to read. You're only helping out other authors and the readers in the meantime, because they get some um, cool new content and discover authors they might not have known of before. Well, you help yourself too, because Amazon does the also bought algorithm stuff. So like if you're recommending stuff that's like your book and they've bought your book because they're on your list, then they follow and they, if they buy the other stuff, you, you help people find you too. So, I mean, it's a win-win rising tide lifts all ships as they say. But, uh, but yeah, I think most authors it's, it's, um, it's just more about raising awareness and they vet what they put out there. So like I've, I've like, you're literally yours is the only one I've done. That wasn't just, I like the book. Let me, let me recommend it. That's cool. Yeah. I remember when um, I asked you to newsletter swap, you were, you weren't hesitant about it, but you're like, um, well, you know what? I'm still growing my newsletter list. And for people who are out there who are thinking like, Hey, I don't have some massive, you know, 40,000 email list yet that definitely does not disqualify you from doing this because for myself, like even if somebody had, you know, 50 emails on their list, 
I would definitely still, still newsletter swap with that person as long as they're still in my genre. Uh, you know, even if I could get five, five readers who would um, like my book out of those 50 and then continue through the series, that would definitely be worth it to me. Even one, heck, one hungry reader who would read the first book in my series and then stick with me as a fan, that would be worth it to me. Yeah, that's a win. So, so Jonathan, I'm thinking it's been said that people are some of their parts, but I think authors are some of everyone else that they've read. Who do you think has been the largest influence on your style of writing and especially on on how you write character-driven novels? Uh, Chris, you're going deep. This is some deep questioning here <laughs> on the podcast. Let's see. Um, so as – Funny as this may sound, one of the first books that really had a huge impact in my life was Lord of the Rings. And I know that I'm not writing a fantasy. I know that I'm writing sci-fi. But even in my first book, when they go through the first book of the Gateway to the Galaxy series, when they go through this gateway, they go to a world where there's Leviathans and Griffins. And I just can't I can't get away from that fantastical um, feeling of good versus evil that Tolkien wrote about in the Lord of the Rings and in all the books that I do, I'm always, there's always some part, some, um, chapter that incorporates, you know, like a dragon or a Lord of chaos that's coming back from who was defeated before, you know, years ago, but he's been on the verge of the universe. And now he's coming back that Sauron type character. Nice. So, so that's where you get the with, where you get the grand scale of the adventures. Who, who do you think did? What's the most memorable character that you remember from fiction? The first one that, that pops in your head. Oh, that's a great question. The most memorable character, I think, it would be Darth Vader. That was the first one. I, without thinking about it too much, Chris, that was the first one that popped into my head. Just, that, he was a great character. Yeah, for sure. Seeing the internal struggle, having that question at the very end if, okay, so if he did, spoiler alert, that if he did kill the Emperor, then does that like give him absolution for that past and all those other Jedi that he killed? Who's to say, right? I mean, <laughs> that's one of the great questions. It never wraps up like, okay, he was 100% forgiven, like for sure, or he still wrestles with that now, even after he's dead. Because in the Force, they become one with the Force after they die, right? Because he appears like in the remastered version as those like ghostly hol- hologram guys, right? Hanging out with not Obi-Wan. everybody does. Not everyone does. I think it's um, you have to be like more powerful in the Force to do that, right? So I guess in one way we kind of like okay, maybe he was absolved from the sins that he committed during his life. But I don't know. There's still that question for me out there, whether he really was or not. All right. So Jer, Jer and I have talked about this a little bit, um, but we're wondering if you have had anyone cosplay your stuff or send you fan art, because Jer and I are pretty sure that's when we can say we've made it. When someone shows up dressed as one of our characters. So have you seen that yet? That would be pretty cool. I definitely have gotten fan art. I have um, some awesome fans. I don't even really like calling them fans because they're friends more than that over the years that I've got to know them. I have some really awesome friends out there who read my work and who have um, done pictures everywhere from like the Elite series, which was my very first series that I released almost six years ago now, to the Archangel Wars and the Dread novels. I have a couple pictures up in my office from people who have sent them to me. And then I haven't had anybody cosplay as one of my characters but i have had someone in the philippines who goes to cosplays and she'll take pictures for me of um for inspiration or like really cool ideas or what she thinks my characters look like in the books she'll take pictures of other cosplayers and send them to me oh that's cool so the the fan art have you posted that anywhere on like your author page or anything like that where people could go you know what i just rehauled my website i shouldn't say i am taking all the credit for something i didn't do my wife was awesome enough to redo my website for me because before i was working with just like you know like the form templates and stuff like that and it looked okay but she put together this awesome website if you go to jonathan-yanyas.com that has all new covers and stuff like that on it and I need to add a section on my new website where I can put all these, all this fan art. I had it on my old website, but not the new one. So that's on the to-do list for sure. 
Very outstanding. Have you ever caught anybody out in the wild reading one of your books? You know what? I haven't personally walked across anyone, but I get uh, pictures sent to me or like tags of people with my book, whether reading in the, um, like at the library or outside in the park, or like when they first order their book and they get in the mail. So like opening it up and taking pictures with it. That's a good idea though, because I always do, I have a private group where I always do contests. I should do a contest like that. Oh yeah. That'd be fun. Well, have you had anybody ask you just like surprise you on the spot, not at a con or anything, uh, ask you for your autograph? You know what? Not at a con, but I just went to do a um, speaking engagement at a place called Keen Coffee here in uh, Southern California. There's a group called Lit Up, and they have different authors come in. I think they do theirs once a month. So I went there. Not They asked me to come, and I was like, yeah, for sure. I'll do a reading and talk about writing and all that stuff. And I wasn't expecting anybody that I knew or to show up for me. You know, I was just going to go and meet some new people. But there were some people there that came up and introduced themselves to me and told me that they had specifically come because they heard I was going to be there. So that was like, a big <laughs> nice. I was like, whoa, because I think for me, I don't know if this is true for you guys, but for me, sometimes I'm just like so into the story, so into the characters and there's explosions and people are throwing up and it's just like mayhem is ensuing. <laughs> then I forget that there's other people reading this sometimes, like there's real people out there who are reading this and interested and invested as me as an author. So when I go to these events and I meet people, I'm like, wow, like you came to see me. That's, that's awesome. Right. Cause, cause the writing is so fun. It, we forget that there's actually people reading this stuff too. For sure. Yeah. Like (laughs) I'll write sometimes, some days I'll write the end on one book. And then I kid you not, you know, that afternoon, that evening, I'm writing chapter one in the next book. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I'm not alone. <laughs> no, that's <definitely> awesome. Not. <laughs> what's what's the weirdest or funniest story you have as an interaction with a fan? Let's see, weirdest or funniest story. So I have a lot of fans online who are like on a Instagram account as well. So on my Instagram account, I post pictures. I work out a lot at the gym, so I still personal train four times a week. Just helps me just stay in shape and get out of the uh, from behind the keyboard. So I'll post, you know, like updates or pictures, working out at the gym and stuff like that. And I've had some very nice but inappropriate comments about uh, my body. <laughs> <laughs> that the uh, flattering, you know, body. like I'm just like, oh, I just you know, kind of just like like those or just kind of not say anything because I don't want to spur on any conversation. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> yeah i'm trying to be as like pg as possible <laughs> most of my comments about my body generally come around christmas and people ask me if uh you know i need a part-time job <laughs> <laughs> people ask me if i'm expecting <laughs> <laughs> it's See, now I'm thinking of that movie Junior from the 90s. See what you did? No, with Arnold? I'll leave that in the show notes. Yeah, with Arnold. If people oh, haven't seen a, it, it's hilarious. What a train wreck that was. <laughs> but it was a funny train wreck. I'm all about the cheesy movies, so what can I say? I'll, I'll throw that in the show notes if you guys haven't seen it, if you uh, younger listeners haven't seen the, uh, the awesomeness from the 90s. So... Jonathan, you've obviously alluded to the mini series you've written, so I'm going to list them out real quick. We have Gateway to the Galaxy, the Elite series, the Archangel series, Warwolves series with Justin Sloan, um, Beyond the Black Volume 1 anthology, The Will to Survive, a charity anthology for hurricane relief, The Vampire Project, Wrath and Ruin, a limited edition science fiction and fantasy collection, Shifting Dimensions, a military science fiction anthology, the Decada series, the new Aurelian Night series, the Dread series, Badland, which looks to be a standalone novel, the Thrive Saga, and the Steampunk Files. Dang. Which is a lot. Yeah, you listed them all out. When you first said you were going to list them out, I'm like, uh, I was going to interrupt. Like, you don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah, it's it's a long list. My my series list would be a lot shorter. I would cheat and list every book I wrote. But, uh, you know, not everyone is as (laughs) prolific as you. And, and um, while all of those sound amazing, uh, we wanted to focus on your, your newest series, the Gateway to the Galaxy series. Uh, I picked this series because it had Stargate vibe, and I love that series. Like, seriously, like, man crush on that series. So I was <laughs> like, this is too perfect. Um, so how did you come up with the idea um, 
or the premise for this series? Like, where did this spark of inspiration come from? So, are you guys familiar with Dave Chesson and his product, KDP Rocket? Oh, yeah. I am. Cool. So, when I was first looking to do uh, a new sci-fi series after Warwolves was over... Oh, <clears throat> real quick, before I start this... Um, JR, you and I are actually also in another project in the um, Galaxy's Edge series with Jason and Spock and Nick Cole. Correct, correct. So that's not only that's another way I know you, but then also I've written my book for them too, and I think you have too, right? And that's already done. That's out there. Yeah, I've, I've, it's waiting for edit. And, right. and for the records, um, the the Dave Chesson that does the KDP Rocket, he's also an in, in, um, an author in his own right, and he actually when we first started announcing this podcast series that we were going to do, he's like, "Well, if you need an international arms dealer, I'm your man. <laughs> we'll talk about it." <laughs> I was like, how do we not have that guy on the podcast? So we're actually working on, on scheduling with him. Dude, for sure. He's such a – it's always cool when you find out – like when you see people post or you see people or hear their podcasts and you're like, oh, that guy is such – he sounds like such a cool guy. I hope he actually is this cool of a guy in real life. Uh-huh. He definitely is because I got to hear yeah. him talk at that uh, Vegas conference, 20 Books to 50K. And every time I've interacted yeah. with him, everything I know about him, he's a really good guy. Anybody that just cold calls you is like, I'm an international arms dealer. I'm like, dude, let's have that conversation. Yeah. You're like, you're in. Okay. So going back uh, to your initial question before I went off on that tangent, the initial question was, how did I decide on this series? So KDP Rocket, I was going to write a new science fiction series and I was looking for a hungry genre, kind of like already within the hungry genre, because I knew the sci-fi, military sci-fi has voracious readers. But I thought to myself, like, I don't want to just like, you know, do like a Star Wars spinoff or a Star Trek spinoff or something else. I, what do the fans want? What are what do pe- what are people hungry for? So I used KDP Rocket to see how many searches there were for different um, like science fiction franchises that already existed. Because I thought to myself, if there already exists a fan base who's hungry for some sort of content, I'm going to write for them. So the ones I after all the research that I did, the two franchises that I found who are actively looking out there wanting more content that is not being written for them necessarily is Stargate and Green Lantern. Wow. So I decided that I was going to get those two ideas and I was going to mash them together with a little bit of kind of like Star Wars with the Jedi Order and I was going to write a series. So I started writing in January, end of January, and I just started cranking them out with my co-author and two weeks ago, it'll be two weeks ago. It was two weeks ago on Thursday. We released the first one and then we rapid released the second one a week after that. And then the third one will be coming out this coming Thursday and fans have outstanding. Yeah, man, it's been, it's been a wild ride full of caffeine and not a whole lot of sleep while I was doing those books. Yeah. But the fans have been super receptive to them and, the, the reviews make me laugh. Even the bad reviews make me laugh, but we can talk about that later. All right. Well, we'll uh, put a pin in that and uh, pause for a word from our sponsor. Under 30,000 feet of water, the exploration rig Leaguer has discovered an oil field larger than Saudi Arabia. With oil so sweet and pure, nations would go to war for the rights to it. But as the team starts drilling exploration wells in their race to claim the sweet crude, a deep rumbling beneath the ocean floor shakes them to their core. Something has been living in the oil. Paul E. Cooley's The Black is a techno-horror thriller reminiscent of movies such as Leviathan and The Thing and puts terror right into readers' ears. The Black, a free podcast novel available from shadowpublications.com and iTunes. Ocean exploration will never be the same. All right. Welcome back. So we had just got done talking with um, Jonathan Yanez. Woo, I yeah, got it right. Yeah. Um, about, his, about his Gateway to the Galaxy series, which is um, basically um, Stargate meets Green Lantern. Um, so speaking of the idea for the series, what role did your co-author, J.R. Castle, have in the genesis of the story? 
Uh, and, and who is this international man of mystery? So um, we'll have a breaking exclusive since nobody up until this point knows who J.R. Castle is. And I've got that question a lot from fans and even fellow authors who want to know. So I'm going to say it publicly here for the first time that J.R. Castle is my wife, Jennifer Yanez. And uh, I think J.R. kind of already alluded like he had a good idea of maybe that's who it was. But now, you know, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so what role the second part of that question is is what role did she play in coming up with the uh the story and i like the last name castle by the way i keep thinking of the the series castle and the the writer you know that sort of follows the uh cop around for his mystery novels oh yeah she um because her maiden name is castillo which is castle in english so she just took her, and her middle name oh. rose so she just took her initials jr and then used her middle name or her maiden name in english Nice. Okay. <clears throat> the other answer. I'm still going the, with the. Uh, the other answer to that is she liked J.R. Hanley so much and respected his work that she decided <laughs> to model her own author uh-huh. career after him and went with J.R. <laughs> That's option B. <laughs> I'll go with option B. Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> so uh, let's see. So you're asking about what role does she play? So we outline the story together. Like we brainstorm together over dinner, over. Um, uh, when our little girl's sleeping, we work on the outline. So all the ideas come from both of us. We agree on outline. Then I consider myself as a good blunt instrument. Like, I don't know if you guys saw um, the Punisher Netflix series. I have no. not. There is a scene at the very beginning where uh, the Punisher, he's just so angry that he has a sledgehammer and he's just like, beating on this brick wall just oh, until his hands are bloody just over and over again days on end because he's so angry i'm not necessarily that angry but i'm that same type of blunt instrument where if you put a task in front of me i can just go so what i've been doing is i have just been cranking out the books so i write the first draft the first you know 55 60 000 words mm-hmm And then Jennifer gets it and she goes through it more with adding detail and world building and making sure all the character description is on point and that the characters sound like they're supposed to sound. And that's even more important now as we head into book four, that everything is true to what we set up in book one. So have you guys seen the Avengers, the very first one? Yeah, I have. There's a scene in there when Captain America is talking to Iron Man. And Captain America's like, we need a plan of attack. And Iron Man's like, I have a plan, attack. (laughs) So I'm more like the Iron Man, just like, go get it. Not a whole lot of capacity to have multiple different um, projects going on at the same time, but just very narrowed in on one. And she's the exact opposite. I don't know how she does this, but she's able to juggle. She handles all our cover art too. So she's working with three, no, four different cover artists right now. Because we're going to be doing spinoffs and we have other authors that want to write in our universe. So she's working with all these different cover artists at the same time so we can have covers ready. She's working with editors. She's going through our books after I'm done with them to make sure that they're on point. And she wants to write her own series within this universe of just her. So she has a, a large capacity for work. Hmm. That sounds, sounds a lot like my JR. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess we both have JRs now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she's prettier. <laughs> oh, gotta be. <laughs> Ow. Ouch. <laughs> I'm crying inside. All right. Well, then we will throw, since we're doing this interview, uh, we'll throw um, Madam Castle's um, author page and stuff in there, too, so you can, you can check out what she's doing. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, now that it's uh, public knowledge. I'm going to tell the readers on my page and then I'm sure more and more stuff will be coming out soon as well. Outstanding. So you described the series as Green Lantern meets Stargate Universe. Did you mean the specific like Stargate Universe, the series, which I love despite how maligned it is? Or did you mean the franchise in general? So I was talking about the franchise in general, but I know what you're saying about how people didn't really – enjoy the Stargate universe series as much as the other ones. And I am also in that boat where Stargate Atlantis was my favorite Stargate, but I understand what they were trying to do with universe. I wouldn't have written it that way. I write more like Atlantis where it's just like, 
constant uh, jokes and, you know, funny situations with characters and action. Like, that's mine. But I understand what they were doing with Stargate Universe, and I still enjoyed it. I think part of the problem with Universe is that uh, the movie or the TV series industry hasn't caught up with the idea of DVR. So they expect everyone to watch it live. And so when you let your shows get bumped by everything, football games, political announcements, whatever, you mess up the DVRs and then you don't get credit because if I program my DVR to record it at on Mondays on channel, whatever, at nine o'clock and you played at 10, well, you just lost recordings. And then I also think when they made the decisions they did, they don't account for people that stream and everything. So they didn't know. I I don't think they knew um, exactly where it was. But then, of course, I think it was on Fox, which is like the kiss of death for any good show. Right. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. Fox went ahead and bought the rights and they did Stargate Universe. And I feel like I don't know what year Stargate Universe came out, but I feel like it was like right as all this streaming content started coming. So they were trying to figure out what to do with it, to your point, with the whole DVR and being bumped in different times and stuff like that. So I think between those two things, between going to Fox and not figuring out, you know, the the right way to market it and the timing, that probably was a kiss of death. Yeah, it came out in 09. I I remember watching it because... It was what my wife and I would watch after we came home from house hunting because that was right before we bought our house. So, nice, but uh, but yeah, it was it was a good show. It was it was maligned, I think. But what do people know anyway? So, the Gateway to the Galaxy would clearly be a series because well, you said it was, and it's on the title page. Um, so, where where do you see this uh, series going? You have two books out. The third is up for pre order, and you said you're working on the fourth. So, what's next for these characters? So let's see. So we just uh, signed a contract with uh, Podium, the audiobook publisher. And I saw the series being nine because I wanted to do three arcs, like within the bigger story arc. I wanted to do three arcs of three books. So it'd be nine altogether. Nice. But Podium asked if we would be willing to do more. So we signed a 10 book contract with Podium for now for the series with the option of doing more. And then I'm also writing the Aurelian Knights. And if you just replace that Aurelian with a Jedi, you have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Because one thing that I really wanted to see in the Star Star Wars universe that I haven't is I just wanted to see firsthand and meet all these new Jedi that were being trained. Like when Luke went out to, you know, train this new Jedi order, we didn't get to see any of that. And that's what I was looking forward to the most. So I told myself, I'm going to take my time as these new Aurelian Knights are discovered and trained and you're going to get to know each one of them and meet their different, um, and find out, you know, what they like and what they don't like as characters and build up this series. So outside of the gateway to the galaxy series, that 10 book arc I'm talking about, I'm going to do a spinoff series that just, I'm going to write called the new Aurelian Knights. And is that in the same universe as the gateway to the galaxy? Yes. So we'll have the new Aurelian Knights in the same universe And then I've co-authored a different series with April Baker called the Decadia Code or the Decadia series. You mentioned it. And when you were listing off those books that I had written, so April and I worked really well together. We wanted to write a new series and she loves Stargate. She loves Stargate um, Atlantis the most. And I was like, perfect. I was like, that's what I'm doing now. Why don't we co-author a Stargate um, like spinoff within this bigger universe together? And she's like, perfect. She's on, she said she was on board. So we already started working on that. So with her and I, we bounce back chapters. So she's writing it from one POV and she'll do a couple chapters and then she'll send it to me and I'll read what she's written. And then I'll write a couple chapters in my, my POV and then send it to her. And we just bounce back and forth. Oh, wow. So so you make the story up as you go along. Um, Yeah, we have like an idea, like we've outlined before, we have an idea, okay, this is what's going to happen with our characters. But I mean, as you guys know, when you're writing, things change. So just because we know exactly where it's going to end doesn't mean we necessarily know like chapter for chapter what's happening in the middle. Nice. And she's been, she has been doing really well on her own too, outside of our books together. She just got her series, her first series, or one of her first series, The Ghost Files, picked up by Sony to uh, be made into a movie. Wow. Yeah. So there's some big news. All her hard work's paying off. She's a great person. So (laughs) one of, um, 
you know, partly when I decide to buy a book, I do read the reviews. Um, I generally start with the bad reviews and see what they say. And then I'll read, you know, the top, you know, four or five star reviews just to get a vibe for it. Um, obviously, I accept that taste vary. So, you know, if they say it's an editing piece of mess, you know, that weighs in. But the rest of it, I'm just looking to get more of reader interpretation. So skimming your reviews of book one uh, for Gateway to the Galaxy. Um Somebody wrote that you were just a modern knockoff of Edgar Rice Burroughs. So can you can you live with being compared to such a literary icon? You know what? I looked at myself in the mirror for a long time after I read that review. And I think I came to the conclusion that if that's the worst that people have to say about me, then I could live with that. <laughs> <laughs> the other, because I was like, I forget if that was my one or two star review, because I have another review that was bad. It's and a it, one star. Okay, so then the two star review said, "Eh, it was okay, it was all right, whatever." But I, if I had the option between reading this again or watching Stargate, I would watch Stargate. And you know what? I, I saw that one too. Yeah, I can't fault them for that. That's awesome, man. I don't. I usually don't read a book more than once anyway. So after I read a book, if I had an option between reading my own book that I've already read or watching Stargate, I'd probably watch Stargate too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so just so in case people are unfamiliar with Edgar Rice Burroughs, so he wrote Tarzan, he wrote uh, John Carter of Mars, so he he wrote um, some some really iconic stuff. Yeah, I, I thought, um, if you're not familiar with him, I thought about going back and like responding back to some of those reviews, but I don't know. I just nobody's got time for that. I'm trying to write the next book. That's right. Yeah, I. Uh, I never uh, read my own because I'm afraid like I'll start crying. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I do remember one that I got and somebody replied to. So I didn't. But they were like, you know, in America, the Marines or the Army says Hua, the Marine says Ura. The British uh, originally at one point in time, I don't know if they still do, said Huza. So when I was like writing Space Marines, I said, well, I'll do something a little bit different. And I, I changed it. And somebody replied, that's not what Marines say. And and the comment that replied to it was just the best. It's like, yeah, but that's what Space Marines say. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. So, but um, and so um, one of your reviewers, for the record, called this series the bastard child of Green Lantern and Doom, the video game, if you're unfamiliar, with a dash of masculine flavor. Um, they actually thought this was a bad thing. Uh, you know, I thought that sounded kind of cool. And it's why I bought the book. Um, and I've read other <laughs> rebo- um, the other good reviews from the, the, um, before buying it, and all of them seem to think you captured the Stargate and Green Lantern vibe for the series. But, but how do you keep that up now that that expectation is set as you grow this universe? Yeah, so, I mean, just staying true to what the fans want. And in every chapter, my the three things that I'm trying to hit on is action, comedy, and character development in every single chapter. So if you're not laughing or be, I have a, brought a smile to your face, there's explosions going off or you're finding out more about these characters, like what really drives them, and you're being able to relate to them. Like with my main character, Frank, he grew up in a uh, – in a really um, poor household with parents that loved him. So you get to see why when the book, spoiler alert, when the book first starts, he's, he comes kind of off like as kind of money hungry and he doesn't really care about anybody. But then as you get to know him and his character develops, you're like, oh, this is why the way he is. And so just relate, getting characters to relate, to getting readers to connect to these people who are them. Um, just because I feel like, in books, when we fall in love with characters that we want to know more about, it's because, in a little way at least, they remind us of ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's important. I think uh, I think if the reader can't connect with the character in some way, or at least understand the character's point of view, like if you have a a bad guy as your main character, of course, every bad guy thinks they're they're the good guy in their own mind. Um, then it's really hard to connect with the. Uh, with the readers, they, they need to understand them, even if they, they can't relate with them. Right. No, yeah, that's exactly right. Like my main character, Frank Wolf, he's everybody who's ever been beaten down, ever has been bullied, who's ever been told, no, you can't do this. He's he's them. And I feel like that's everybody in life that to one extent or another. So the next question is, have, have you been offered or are you looking to grow the, uh, the book into movies or RPGs, video games? So I'm super like, like I was saying before, I'm just a blunt instrument. 
my wife has more of the capacity to have different projects going on at the same time, being able to manage it all in a beautiful way. So right now we have audiobooks um, locked down. What we're going to after is foreign rights. And tw- our goal is by the end of the year, by the end of 2018, is to have a foreign rights locked in. And then also in 2019, the goal will be after what you're saying, either a video game adaptation or some sort of TV or movie being made. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So the uh, when Chris, when you were talking about just a second ago, I just didn't want to interrupt our guest, where every uh, hero or every um, villain is like a hero in his mind. It reminds me of that quote. It says that uh, that was every man's a hero to his dog, but no man is a hero to his valet. <laughs> Are you familiar with that quote? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. That's a good so, one. It's uh, it's that's the American bastardization of a French quote that I heard. Um, so I was, I listened to, um, I let history and politics flavor like ideas for my stories. So Chris oftentimes be like, that makes no sense. That's so obscure. And I'm like quoting him all the different times in history it's happened. And then I realized that if nobody else gets it though, it's still not right. Um, and so that was just, uh, it was a French philosopher that came out during their, uh, the French revolution said it, but I can't remember who it is. I'll have to see if I can find that for the show notes. But yeah, that, that always, every time I write like a villain, I keep that in mind, you know, like every, every man's a hero in his own story kind of thing. So is there anything else that's awesome about the gateway to the galaxy series that you want to tell us spoilers? It's, It's just been really fun meeting these characters and seeing what I can do with them being so different because the Aurelian Knights, they're basically the green lantern Corps. There's an Aurelian Knight for each planet. And they're powered by these van braces and the van braces feed off their spirit, their fighting spirit. So whether um, a really knight can be found and it could be a little girl who's in a wheelchair, but if she has the strongest fighting spirit on her planet, then those van braces, that power will come to her. So it's been really cool. being. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't know if you guys, I'm going to get super geeky right now, but do you guys watch any anime? My wife is my yeah. oldest, so I've watched some. <clears throat> okay, cool. My favorite anime is called Gurren Lagan. Have you guys heard of that one? Nope, I have not. Okay, the rabbit hole is about to go pretty deep, guys. So Gurren Lagan is basically mech warriors. So these people get into these mech warriors, and the mech warriors are powered by their force of will. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Like the Green Lantern Corps, their force of will, what I'm doing with the Aurelian Knights. So it doesn't matter if you are a slave. It doesn't matter if you're a little girl. It doesn't matter if you're an older man, you know, who's um, getting towards the end of his life. As long as you have that fighting spirit and that will, then you can do anything. Because the van braces that come to these people allow them to create constructs like the Green Lantern Corps. So we can have, you know, a little girl who maybe can't walk, but maybe she can fly because her fighting spirit is so strong and alive with her. And then you'll have our uh, main character, Frank Wolf, who has, you know, been surrounded by Marines. He's a Marine. So when he creates his constructs, they're all like rifles and uh, different types of handguns and stuff like that. But if you were to get an Aurelian Knight from a different planet who's uh, more familiar with maybe like staffs or bows, that would be the constructs that they would be creating. So there's just so much you can do. I'm getting excited just talking about it. There's just like the, the possibilities are just endless. <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds, so, sounds a little like a, like Full Metal Alchemist too. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's all that stuff. So here, here's a, a little insider baseball stuff that when Chris um, lists these things, it's not so much that he's that nerding out. He also knows that I have to look up all this stuff for the show notes later. So his it's a little game for him to see if he can make the list as long as possible. Is that why he threw in the full metal alchemist at the end there? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he I'm, caught on finally. <laughs> I'm a little slow, but but I'm not dumb. So, you know, before before we transition out of the, the gateway to the galaxy stuff. Uh, you mentioned that you watch uh, Stargate Atlantis, and I'm actually currently watching that that series with my youngest. I'm, I think, like halfway through season two right now. So, what uh, what was your favorite Doctor? Did you like the British guy or the uh, the Firefly? Um, I can't remember her name. The actress from Firefly that came in to play the Doctor. I know. What was your favorite Doctor? I forget her name in real life, but in um, the show, it's Jennifer. Jewel State. Jewel State. I That's think. Her name. I actually like the British guy. I thought he was funnier. I did too. I mean, I like her as an actress. I think she does a good job. But, but I did like the uh, 
the little bit of uh, difference that he brought to the show. Yeah, for sure. I appreciated that too. I'm in, um, I'm rewatching the series right now with my daughter as well. We're in season five, so we're almost through to the end. I'm kind of regretting as I turn on each episode because I know that the end's coming. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it's fun getting to watch somebody watch it for the first time, you know, because then, you know, it's all still new. <laughs> yeah, for sure. When the uh, aliens appear or the bugs, I'm always kind of like keeping an eye out for her to make sure she's okay and not getting too freaked out. But she's handling it well so far. So the, f- the funny thing is if you ever watch any of the uh, actors that played that, so the everyone complained on the fan side about um, – Taylor Amagan getting pregnant like out of nowhere and then oh, suddenly yeah. there's this husband character well the real the reason they did that is because she got pregnant in real life so they're scrambled to make it fit right right rather than get rid of her because she was such a fan favorite and so when she was right after she had the baby she did some scenes where she was the wraith queen and Uh-oh. so she was she was she was breastfeeding and the guy that played Colonel Shepard kept messing with her. Like you're the worst mom ever. Your daughter is looking up to bond with you and you are a vampire. And he would go on and on and like mess with her. That's so funny. <laughs> they, they, they talk about that at some of the panels on the cons. Cause I, I can't make it all the way out to California for some of the bigger conventions, but I'll watch the recorded panels. Hey JR, can you add that into the show notes, please? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For all the crayon jokes. <laughs> all right, oh, I'm adding it now. Since you write military science fiction, what's your biggest pet peeve about how other authors write mill sci-fi? Or to put it another way, if you were going to recommend to new authors writing military sci-fi, what would you recommend they not do without listening to any specific books? I guess just making sure that for people who were not in the military, because my father served in the 82nd Airborne during Vietnam, and he worked his way up to um, sergeant while he was there. But for myself, not being in the military at all, it was kind of just like a crash course that I've been on since August of last year when I started writing War Wolves. Just understanding how the ranks work and the commissioned officers versus the non-commissioned officers and all the history that comes with that. And then the Marines and then the guys in the army kind of ribbing each other and like what that means and how the Air Force works in with that and who's making fun of who because of what and what um, weapons that they would be using now and what weapons they would be using in the near future. So just a ton of research. So I would tell authors, yeah, just make sure you do all your research with ranks, with just, you know, the um, community that is in the military all the fun stuff that, you know, even you guys, even you guys right here on this podcast is a great example, kind of like ribbing each other and having a good time. So just, yeah, digging deep and making sure you're getting all those, capturing all the different feels for different branches of the military and different ranks. It, it's sort of like that sibling rivalry. Like I could beat the crap out of my sister or brother, or brother but nobody else better lay a finger on them, you know? Right, sure. yeah. That's sort of the approach to it. <laughs> and how the Marines always win. <laughs> Sorry, I started coughing. So, uh, following that, what do you think are the best units in military science fiction? Obviously, you'd give yourself top billing. So, other than your war wolves, what would you say were the best military units in sci fi? Um, are we talking about like specific from a book or just kind of like, I don't know, like mech warriors in general? Whatever you want to answer. So, I, um, I have a big fascination with mech warriors right now. Just when I realized that the Hulk buster from the Avengers is nothing more than a mech. Oh yeah. Right. That kind of like blew my mind the other day. I was like, wait a minute. When Tony Stark gets into that big Hulk buster, they're just doing mech warriors. And then I don't know, you know, that saying like, Oh, if you think about having a white car, if you own a white car, you start seeing white cars on the road more and more. Yeah. Right. So the same thing happened with mech warriors. Like, now that I'm thinking about that, like, oh, yeah, the Hulkbuster is a mech warrior. I'm reading books with different mech warriors in it. I'm going to include some sort of um, mech warriors in my series as well. Because I feel like there's so much that you can do with that as well. Just like the, the weapons that you can put on them with the different sizes. I just saw Pacific Rim 2. Did you guys watch that yet? Oh, I haven't seen it I have yet. not. I don't. I wait till it comes out on DVD. I don't do movie theaters. Gotcha. Yeah. So we just went to the theater and we saw Pacific Rim 2. So Mech Warriors, I feel, are on the rise if they've ever been on the downslope. I feel like maybe it's kind of like a subculture, like a, a subgenre of sci-fi. But for sure, I would I would give top billing to Mech Warriors. So are you going to buy your uh, your daughter a toddler mech? Yeah, I actually um, 
Look that up because you put them in the show notes on that other podcast, uh, JR. You had to bring that up. <laughs> show was going so well. Uh, was it was it with Scott Bartlett? That was when you were talking about the child mech warriors? Yeah, but we also yeah. we also did it on the uh, the tech episode where we looked back at twenty seventeen. Yeah. Are you, is that like an inside joke? Or, <laughs> I hear Chris. No, he keeps bringing it up right. because it is so wrong. <laughs> Such a bad idea. I'd, I'd rather flip bacon with my face. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hilarious. And if you, if you look it up, I'm going to put that in the show notes. But if you look it up, there's actually a video. Um, of the toddler mech and the I, I i really suspect when they built the toddler mech it was just you know to test the uh the viability of everything like in smaller scale because it was cheaper for like a prototype and then somebody's like hey a kid could fit in this but so there's actually video of a uh, the adult version and the kid version like doing karate katas in an arena oh sure sure <laughs> it's karate mech. that's that's a great idea oh <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> Power Rangers aren't going to build themselves. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Voltron's not going to build itself. Ah, now you got to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, what do you prefer? You can answer either as writing or reading or both. But do you prefer the large ship and fleet battles or more of the, the, uh, the space marine fights? Um, I, I prefer the more space marine fights because I feel like with ships, it's like, you know, lasers and rail guns and stuff like that are going out in different directions. And you have the captain on the bridge shouting orders and then the bridge shaking because the shields are going down and the sparks are coming down from the ceiling. But I feel like with space battles, there's, I, I feel at least personally that I'm kind of like in a box of what I can do, whereas I have boots on the ground. I feel more freedom to explore different characters, what's going on, you know, different explosions and weapons. So my preference is boots on the ground. So I took my son to the uh, to the Hampton Air and Space Museum, and one of the things they have is like some of the shuttle mock-ups where you can sit in there and get pictures, and they have a, like a B-42. And I've actually had this theory that with uh, a lot of the advanced um, aviation stuff, that a lot of those switches and knobs, and they don't actually do anything. They're just there to make it more expensive so they can make more money. <laughs> so I have this theory... I have this theory with spaceships that they actually build in for space battles, like this little pouch. And what does this do? Oh, that's just so we can have effects for the fights. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Because, you know, it adds to the drama. Why not? Yeah, right. Why not? <laughs> let's, let's have the random sparks. Yeah, or you need that button that has the hoses on the wall kind of shake loose and then like smoke or whatever yeah. steam comes from those hoses. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember watching because I like to watch a lot of the – um, cause I like the behind the scenes stuff. So I watch a lot of the, the cons where they'll interview various guests. And that was one of the things they talked about. And I don't remember what, what series it was from, but like where they would have the actors sit on the command chair and do something and like, but you only get two takes because it takes so many hours to set everything up. Like <laughs> you have to wonder like how much of that. And they're like, eh, when you see bad acting, it was like, it's good enough. I'm not resetting that dang thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's you, Chris. <laughs> That's you. I didn't mark that. Your bio mentioned. You did. <laughs> we'll leave this in because you can laugh at Chris. All right. So your uh, your bio mentions obviously that you have a young a young one at home. Um, so how do you manage to balance the the writing uh, and keeping yourself from pulling all of your hair out? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, besides what we just talked about right now with watching Stargate, I don't watch a whole lot of TV. Like I watch Stargate every once in a while with my daughter after we've gone outside and played and we've read some books and stuff like that. But pretty much TV for the most part has been cut out of my life. And then also the next thing to go was sleep. So I uh, don't watch TV anymore for the most part. Don't sleep a whole lot when I'm working on a project or I have a deadline. So I stay at home with my daughter. And what I found is if I can wake up, do those like 5, 6 a.m. wake up times, I can get in a few thousand words before she wakes up. And then we hang out, we play, and we color unicorns together, maybe watch some Stargate Atlantis, and then she'll go down for a nap after lunch. So between like 12 to 1.30, 12 to 2, and that's when I can uh, put in another couple writing sprints. So I've um, kind of fell into this groove where I found that if I have 30 minutes, just not interrupted, no Facebook, anytime like that, 
just 30 minutes of writing, I can get into uh, like a thousand words at a time. So if I can do like two of those sprints, two 30 minute sprints in the morning, that's 2000 words Two while she naps, that's 4,000 words. And that's my writing goal for the day, 4,000 times, 4,000 words a day. And then at night when she goes to bed, that's when I can either, you know, clean up any, um, sprints maybe that I didn't hit during the day or answer emails or everything else that goes along with writing books. So we have it slightly different because my young ones are boy. So I have to worry about dirt in all these inappropriate places, but, but you have to worry about the dreaded glitter. Dude, Mm -hmm. I feel like this chick over here, I call my daughter a chick in a loving way. Just my little space Marine. Her name is Josephine. So my little Joe, I'm getting the best of both worlds because she's outside. Like I have a Husky and Alaskan Malamute. So she's outside running around with them, trying to climb on top of them to ride them like a horse. She's playing in the Mm -hmm. mud, but then she'll come inside and she'll get her little stickers and start coloring and stuff like that. So I feel you, man. You're not alone. (laughs) Moving on, I understand that you're the president of the California Writers Club. So how'd you get strong armed into that? Um, Jokes aside, tell me about the organization. Um, Are you all jokes aside or can I put one in there? Uh, Put one in there. (laughs) Okay. I know you can't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, California Writers Club was founded by Jack London in like 1908. And there's a bunch of different chapters here in California. I think there's like 20 some branches. So I am the president of the branch that meets in Orange County. So I've been president for a year now and I've been a member of the club for about five years. We meet the second Saturday of every month and we always have a guest speaker that comes in and talks with us. So it's just a great community to be involved with. You get to talk just like with you guys, like what, what we're doing right now, I get to do once a month at least, but face to face with other authors. So just the community I've, I've met a bunch of really cool authors through it. Um, Nick Cole has come and spoken at one of our events. So hands Andy Peliquin, who's another indie published author. So yeah, so just community and uh, putting myself out there when I normally wouldn't, because if it was up to me, if I was left to my own devices, I would be like Smeagol in The Hobbit. You know, when they found him, he was like way, way, way down there in the caves and he was stroking his precious. <laughs> and then he also had the ring. Yeah. Uh, precious. Yeah. And then, uh, Phrasing. <laughs> so that would be me if I was left to my own devices. But I know it's important for me to get out there, give back to the community because I've been given so much. And then just to get outside my own comfort zone, like. I have no desire to stand in front of, you know, 30, 40 people at a meeting, but I know that the need is there and that's something that I can do to help out other authors. Sure. And that, that, that we, you're not the, uh, the crazy guy living in the woods in a cabin, long beard and stacks and stacks of books everywhere. For sure. Without my wife, that's basically what I would be. Mm-hmm. You say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> I, I mean, it would be a different lifestyle for sure. So, so how'd you, how'd you earn the Jack London Award for Literature? Was it because you're part of that writing group? So the Jack London Award is an award that they give out every other year for authors who are contributing to um, the author community. So I didn't win it for a specific book or anything like that. What I started to do is Scholastic has a program where they um, – take submissions from kids who are in junior high and high school and they have their own reward program where they put up, you know, the best new upcoming authors. So Scholastic reached out to my branch and they asked, Hey, we know you're a group of published authors and we need help grading all these submissions that we're having from these kids. Would you be willing to help us out? So I said, for sure. So I spearheaded that over the last two years. Um, get finding people to donate their time to read some of these kids' submissions and then grade them and send them back to Scholastic. So helping out and partnering with Scholastic with the California Writers Club earned me that uh, Jack London Award. That's nice. That's that's a fun thing to be able to give back, especially when it's something you're really, you're really passionate about. Yeah, for sure. Like I try to give back as much as I can and make time for people who have questions or because I mean. I don't know if anybody actually believes this, but nobody gets to where they are by themselves. I mean, sure, maybe you didn't have somebody, you know, come to your house and meet with you and tell you all the secrets, but everybody's reading blogs or listening to podcasts like the podcast you guys are on to learn more. They're reading books. They're doing research that other people have put out. They're finding information. So nobody gets to the top of the mountain by themselves. And I, I've found that early out and I want to, you know, give back to those people who are, 
climbing right alongside with me. Yeah, paying it forward. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, enough about you, Jonathan. The shameless plugging is over. This is the part of the interview where we talk about what you're reading. So, Spell it. What you're reading? I don't know if you guys have heard of this book. It's not very well known. It's called Starship Trooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I had uh, yeah. seen the movie. I had seen the movie early on, but now that I'm writing all this stuff, like now that I've been writing military fiction, I have just been inundating myself in it. I am bathing in military science fiction, guys. So from audiobooks, I, I've been doing audiobooks more just because I'm so busy. But when I can, sitting down and reading, so I've written everything from Richard Fox to Galaxy's Edge to uh, Old Man's War to like, I mean, just as much as I can. I look at like the top 10, top 20 bestsellers and I'm just like going to town. You just wanted to add more to the list, didn't you? Yeah, I was trying to th- – <laughs> hey, you caught me on that one. I was going to see if you are going to say anything. I was going to go more, but I know you have a family too, so I didn't want to list off like 10 different things for you to put on. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not one of those people that reads fast, but I know some. Like my sister reads a book a day. Yeah. So I would believe it if you told me that you were reading like that much. Like, and that's what I read this morning. <laughs> no, no. I wish, I wish I had time to read that much. But with writing – I'm usually like listening to audiobooks in my car or while I'm doing yard work or yeah, mostly, mostly in the car. So I, I do the same thing. I, I tend to listen to audiobooks just lately because it's, it's what I have fine for. I can do that while I'm washing dishes or going for my walks. But anyway, do you, uh, have you taken up the audiobook train yet, Chris? Oh yeah. I've, I've got, I've got probably about 30 or 40 that I've listened to so far and probably another 30 or 40 that I, I have yet to listen to. So I know um, one of the authors, um, Jonathan, that we, we've interviewed and that we're, we're big fans of, Terry Mixon, was mentioning – he showed me a spreadsheet because he tracks all the audiobooks he has and how long it is. And so he's got like something like five years worth of audiobook listening time Dang. in his TBR list. We're not quite there yet <laughs> yeah. because my wife pulled the card <laughs> off, but, uh, but it's getting there. Oh, man. Yeah, I listened to the Terry Mixon uh, interview, and it, that's another person that like I've seen on the top seller lists and stuff like that I know of him, but it was really cool to be able to hear his voice and like, yeah, like the, the person you hope he is, like, you know, on social media, he actually is that cool in real life. He is that well, you'll cool. Get to meet him in, um, you'll get to meet him in Vegas because he's going to the, uh, the author 20 Books to Vegas writing con- um, conference. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I can't wait. Is there, you know, the second part is we like to, to put the science in science fiction, even though we write the uh, hand wavy, um, <clears throat> Chris. So um, are there any new scientific breakthroughs that you're following or excited by? So this is going to weird you guys out. Check this out. There is a company who rents out people for different events. And what they do is, let's say I needed to have a meeting with Chris, but I wasn't in Chris's city, so I couldn't be there. But JR was in Chris's city. So I would rent JR and JR would wear this goggle kind of virtual reality um, viewer. And on the other side of this virtual reality (laughs) goggle viewer would be like an iPad, like a screen that would have my face on it. So inside (laughs) inside JR's goggles, he would still be able to see everything. And I could also type what I wanted JR to do. So I could say... Uh, JR, ask Chris or uh, go walk over here. And then JR would sit in his goggles and he would go ahead and do whatever I needed to do. But my face would be on that screen on the outside. So JR gets to be my meat puppet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're basically, you're basically renting out people. Isn't that nuts? The, That's wow. crazy. I've seen that, but I didn't, I thought it was like a gag. I didn't think it was real. No, it's real. And so people can, I guess it's most commonly used for like meetings, like board meetings and stuff like that. But I mean, there's all, I'm sure you can imagine there's all kinds of different ways to use them. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> meat puppets. What about you, Chris? So the, uh, the European space agency is no longer proceeding full speed ahead with its campaign to send a 1600 kilogram satellite into low earth orbit to grab defunct earth trash. I guess earth space trash, these satellites are going defunct, just little bits and pieces that fall off rockets when they go into orbit. That's actually becoming a serious enough problem that these countries are now looking at basically building trash trucks to go up and collect these little bits and pieces and either shoot them far away into space or bring them back to earth for recycling. I just thought 
That's interesting. I saw an infographic probably a month or so ago where it showed all the little bits and pieces that NASA and ah, I forget what that what that base is under under Cheyenne Mountain. That's in Stargate. Yeah, that's, where, that's what I was about to say. That's where Stargate lives. Yeah, but but that's that's a real base. It 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 was their it's supposed to be their nuclear proof base, but they're tracking I I lost I lost track, but I think it was just under a million little objects floating around in space that eventually we're going to run out of of room for satellites because all these little tiny things become micrometeorites and are going to destroy everything we put up there, which is going to make more space trash. So I just thought that was interesting that eventually that's going to be a job to go up in space and collect trash. That sounds like a premise for a story we need to write. Like we need to have like the trash the trash core one going up into space and collecting all yeah. the trash and then maybe they meet aliens or something crazy like that happens up there. <laughs> or maybe aliens tried to invade, but they got blown up by all our trash. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's um it's the Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Station, which is part of NORAD, and NORAD. it falls under the Air Force it falls under the Air Force Space Command. Oh, now he's gonna put that in Google for the win. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I walked into that one. I should not have Googled. I should not have Googled. I wonder what the record is for how many show notes are on one of your guys' shows. We should try to break that today. Was that uh, right? well, CJ yeah. Carrillo? But oh, it was CJ a two-hour episode. Oh, okay. yeah, it was CJ Carrillo. But it was a, and his was the worst because he's like listing all of these like um, RPGs that aren't around anymore. So I had to go into the Wayback Machine <laughs> to find them, and <laughs> it's it's crazy. But um, so the alien planet of Trappist-1, it may be too wet for life. It was one of the um, unique solar systems in that it had four planets in the Goldilocks zone. And so they've been studying more and more. Um, They actually have a curiosity stream, which is sort of like Netflix, but for nerds. My wife jokingly calls it my Nerdflix subscription. Love it. Um, But basically, it's all documentaries and like about everything from like the, the prototype man to to sci-fi stuff they've got a lot of stephen hawking's and stuff they really ought to sponsor our, our episodes as much as we talk about them but so they had an episode about the trappist one system or the trappist system because you know four planets in the goldilocks zone and it's only like five light years away or something that you know is totally manageable well recent study has shown that trappist one the first one in the habitable um zone in the goldilocks zone maybe actually too wet for life too much ocean not enough land and all that um, and so obviously everything we find out about a bit, ha- wow, speak much habitable planets, um, is a good thing. Um, I was surprised that hearing too much water could be a bad thing. I, I thought, you know, we've got aquatic life, so surely that's good. Right. But, um, the lead author, um, Cayman Unterborn, who is a postdoctorate fellow at the school of earth and space exploration at Arizona state university, um, told space.com that it's interesting that it's so, um, water born, uh, planet, but it may actually mean it's in insu- unsuitable for life. But I mean, you know, I, I imagine you could surf the heck out of it. <laughs> wow. A planet of basically nothing but water. A water planet. Have you guys seen interstellar? Yeah. No, I have not. It's on my two watch list. Uh, okay, they crash land on a, or they land on a planet like that too, where there's just like a huge ocean, huge body of water. Cool. I'll oh, have to check it out. And there's Kevin Costner's Waterworld. Yeah. <laughs> Show notes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do people actually read these though? I don't know. I mean, as a listener of your show, I can say that I have before. Like, I don't after every show, I don't like go through all the show notes. But if there's something that you guys have said that I'm interested in, I've looked it up before. Uh, now you have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jonathan, uh, as we bring this um, episode to a close, where can listeners find you? So, yeah. So if you want to go straight to the books, it's just Amazon.com. You can put in my name. It's Jonathan. And then my last name is Y-A-N-E-Z. If you want to connect, you can go to jonathan yanyascom for my website or on Facebook, feel free to friend me and I have a page and we can hang out. All right. And as usual, that is all in the show notes. What about us, Chris? Where can they find us? Our website is www.sfshenanigans.com. Our Twitter is at SFS, that's Sierra Foxtrot Sierra underscore show. 
and our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that uh, archived episode that was in the uh, in the digital memory hole that we found. We thought you'd enjoy it. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the archive for the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back at our regular scheduled time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.